right. Well, hey, this is uh, Greg Myroth with Just Art Pottery. Um, today is going to be our very first episode of what we're going to call Pottery Conversations. We've had a lot of people ask us to do something like this over the years and never was really sure how I wanted to do it. But today I got my good friend, Tony Olson, who's a recognized expert in University of North Dakota School of Mines Pottery. He's going to be kind of my first test subject as we try launching this thing. So we're trying a new recording. We're doing this on Zoom. Hopefully the volume works out. Tony's got some great pots to show us here today from, from UND. Um, and just kind of one other thing about Tony, like whenever I, I've had questions over the years about UND, he's kind of been my resource. He's, the, he's my go-to guy. So um, and him and I have a lot of good conversations. So I thought him and I could have a nice, easy talk here today and just let you guys maybe learn a little bit more about UND. I'm sure I'm going to learn some things too. So uh, with that, Tony, welcome to our very first episode of Pottery Conversations. All right, here we go. Yeah, here we go. So I guess, first of all, like, why don't you just give us a little background? Like, uh, you know, I got, I was, ever since I've known you, you've been the, my UND guy, but like, give us a little bit of background, like how you got interested in UND pottery to start with. Yeah, well, you know, it wasn't automatic. Like a lot of people s start out to, you know, focus on one thing. It started with me with um, basically trying to find another thing to do so I didn't have to teach summer school. <laughs> well, years ago, um, maybe 40 years ago, when I was teaching in high school, my wife brought home a lamp and it was, uh, it cost $20. Now $20 to us back then was a huge deal, but it started the first piece of, or the first antique we bought as a couple. How long ago was that? Well, 40 years ago. So we started 42 years. So, so 80, um, 80 or something. Yeah, 40 years ago. So then I was teaching summer school and one of my students came in one morning, sat on the desk, fell over and puked on the floor. <laughs> so I had to pick her up, clean up. And I went home that day and I said, I have got to do something else in the summer. I cannot do this anymore. So we started to buy antiques and anything, glassware, furniture. I would refinish oak furniture um, and pottery. And uh, Marilyn's mom had Roseville in her cabinet, so I knew about that. But if you grew up in North Dakota, you always heard about UND pottery. Sure. And I was born and raised there. So the university was 70 miles north of Fargo. Okay. So we could go up there and they have a great collection. Anybody can see it. You can walk in and look at it. They have probably the most extensive collection, extensive collection in the country. And they have all kinds of pots, good, bad, and anything in between. And uh, so um, being a North Dakota and we knew about that. So I would look for it, but it was hard. You know, it's funny that if you live in North Dakota, you would think you would find a lot of it. Well, you don't, you know, it's like living, now I live in Colorado, you'd think yeah. I'd find Van Briggle. Yeah. You don't. You I know, mean, it's funny you say that, because when I started collecting Van Briggle, we went out to Denver thinking, oh, I'm going to go out in Colorado Springs. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to find a whole bunch of Van Briggle. And you're right. Like there was less of that out there than there was in the Midwest. Yeah, well, the good pottery, I mean, there are collectors in the state and um, they, the stuff they collect, and they've been collecting for years and years and years, longer than I have, and their pottery is not going anywhere. So you don't have a chance to buy it. Um, but anyway, so I started selling antiques at flea markets and we get up at three in the morning, drive to Minnesota, set up sell whatever we could. And in one day, I would make more money than I did teaching summer school. Wow. Yeah. So that kind of began it all. And then one time we'd get up, we go to garage sales because Marilyn always looking for clothes for the kids, you know. And um, I, I, I had a feeling about that we'd get coffee, we'd drive around and look in the paper. And I saw one and I said, you know, that one I got a vibe about. Let's go, let's go over there. So I went over there and on the tables were about 15 pieces of UND, all priced a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. And I told Marilyn, I said, grab everything. So we grabbed everything. 
And plus we grabbed other things too. I mean, there were, there was glassware there, there was all sorts of things. So that was my really first score with UND. And we got home, I dropped it off. I said, let's go back there and see if we missed something. Yeah. So we went back and I started talking to the woman and I said, um, where did you get all this UND? She goes, well, it's mine. I made it. Oh, wow. I said, really? She goes, yeah, I was a student there. And she was a lot older than me at the time. I mean, I was in my late 20s, early 30s. She was in her 70s. And she, her name was Meridel Reed. Okay. And her teacher was Julia Matson. Awesome. She goes, well, why don't you come over to my house and I'll cook you supper and we can talk about it. I said, great, we'll be there. So we went over, had supper with her. And I basically interviewed her. She talked about Julia Matson, what a wonderful person she was, and how she was kind of um, very patient and very quiet and just a, a peach of a teacher. And she just loved it. Well, her stuff was in the 50s, the 50s Matson. Okay. Now, there are different de decades with Matson, and, and a lot of it, uh, the early stuff was kind of arts and crafts from the 20s. And then it changed over time. But in the 50s is when she was a student there. And it was so you had uh, mid-century modern looks, squeeze bag, uh, very colorful stuff, you know. And while she was there, she had one pot with notes on it, like in a music score. Oh. And she said, would you sell that? She goes, yeah. She goes, give me $5. So I gave her $300. And I said, well, I said, I feel bad about the garage sale. I didn't know what, you know, and of course the garage sale filled up fast. So you had to grab. And yeah. so I gave her $300. Now this is a long time ago. So $300 was a pretty good price for it. Yeah. She was just tickled pink, you know, to get $300. And, um, but she was a wonderful woman. And we still have one, Marilyn kept one, one little of her jar. With, that was a shape of an acorn, a little jar. And um, she still has that on her dresser in the bedroom. But that's how I got started. Okay. But I never, um, you know, a lot of these collectors, you know, that collect Groovy and stuff, they can tell you the first pot they bought. Right, and right. they kept it all these years. Well, I, I can't remember any of that. Yeah. So, so Tony, like, was there, cause you know, I, I don't have that exact story, but I have a story of years ago. You actually helped me when I bought that collection, but I bought a collection. I can't remember the lady's name, but she was a student. She had some really cool pots. She did some really neat work, but like, so any idea, like how many students went through the college, like hundreds or. Well, yeah, hundreds. Well, okay. um, but her classes, uh, Margaret Cable's classes were so popular. They had to limit the size. Okay the classes. So there were waiting lists for students to get into her class because I think first and foremost with uh, Margaret Cable is she was an instructor first. Okay. And, um, but you know, she, you know, she was a jack of all trades. She could do it all. She was, uh, ex you know, and, and through my talking to fellow um, um, collectors and um, teachers that taught at the university and and um, there are a lot of books out on it now. There weren't when I was young. There was nothing. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, really, the first time um, North Dakota pottery became a national thing was um, Ralph and Terry Covell uh, had a little, they had that American Art Pottery book. And uh, they wrote a chapter on North Dakota State Pottery, right. the University of North Dakota Pottery. And so that was pretty cool. I mean, they, you know, and then uh, Darlene Dummel wrote the Dakota Potteries book. And um, um, uh, Miller uh, wrote yeah. um, The Cable Years. Yeah. And uh, so all these books came out, but it still didn't, you know, I mean, the, the big auction houses really didn't have a clue what they had when they got it. Right. You know, they weren't sure of value, so they'd put a low reserve on it. And then if they got something, they thought, well, you know, they were surprised. Right. But, um, you know, it was the locals that really promoted it, you know, because they knew about it when the rest of the country didn't. Yeah. So, so how did it, so that, I guess, is that just sort of what, you know, so if it started out as a regional thing, kind of in the Midwest, and then 
you know, just saying some maybe some local auction houses started getting some better prices and it just sort of expanded the because it sort of like reminds me of the story of like how of Newcomb College a little bit, right? And like it sort of went through that era and you, you know, it's high quality handmade pottery and like it's just yeah. seen its well, well exactly. But the difference is in with North Dakota pottery and Newcomb, Newcomb um at least had a quality control. Their their stuff yeah. came up and it was all nice. Yeah. Where yeah. at North Dakota pottery, a lot of the student pieces yeah. you give away. And you, yeah, still you see some that student pieces that are pretty poor. There. Yeah. Oh, it's terrible. It's yeah. just awful. And there's still a lot of it out there. And that doesn't help people being able to identify what's good and what's bad. So with student pieces, student pieces were always just those weren't sold. Those were just or with student yeah. pieces. So student pieces were never sold. It so the instructors yeah, it usually went home with the student and then was passed on through generations. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule, but they kept their stuff. For example, um, um, Schnell, yeah. uh, she uh, had an auction, you know, a well-publicized auction. And her stuff was exceptional. Her and was she would, she made a lot of pottery. So what? So she would have been a student. She was a student, but how long was she a student for? Well, um, I don't know how long she went to school, but, you know, four or five years, you know. So, so she could have conceivably been a student at uh, uh, in the ceramics program as a student for several. Because, I mean, for, you see a lot of Snell pottery. So you think she must have been making pottery for at least several years, right? Yeah. And she did, you know, I mean, but she was, um, she made some masterpieces, you know. Yeah. She also did like studio work. Yeah, you'll find a piece of Chanel that was hand thrown and looks like a studio pot that that somebody else would have made. But at the same time, um, some of her, you know, exceptional work. And I'll show you a piece of Chanel. Um, um, well, I'll show you to you right now. Now, this is a piece of Chanel. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I call that the Lady Godiva vase. Okay. So hand thrown, that's a hand thrown piece and hand carved. Well, it's not. It's carved, but it's a molded. It's a molded. So it's a molded but, shape. Um, and and she usually, yeah, she usually on her nicer stuff, they were molded, but they were molded. But okay. um, this is all hand carved and then glazed. And, um, but it's, it's got a, it was done in the 40s, but it's got an art deco look to it. That's very cool. Yeah. And, um, I got these from, I, I traded two Western pots to get this pot because okay. I couldn't go to the Schnell auction. It was in 1997 and my son, Nick was a wrestler. And so we followed him all around. And so there was a, there was a meet that day. And so, and it was a terrible, terrible. I remember it was an awful day in terms of the weather. Um, and, uh, but she had some, you know, and that's where the really one of the first, very expensive pieces went. Now this pot was expensive, but uh, friends of mine that bought it, I traded them two Western pieces for that one, for this one. And um, and uh, his name was Con uh, Short. He was a rancher from the western part of the state, and his wife Sandy, and they were uh, wonderful people, and and um, really smart in terms of being able to tell quality. Well, they were there. And they bought this, and then they bought all the other Western pieces that were in the sale, which, you know, a wagon yeah. um, went around in a circle with all sorts of Western designs, hand-painted. And then, of course, the um, um, at the time, it was the most expensive piece of bentonite sold, and um, that was bought by Kurt Rustand, and that... He still has that today. It was a beautiful piece okay. with a Native American on horseback shooting his bow into a bison. And oh, it's, wow. And it's, you, can, you, can, you can see it on any, just Google it. It'll pop up. It's a very famous face, but uh, just a tremendous face. And that went for, at the time, $13,000. Oh, my goodness. What year was that? Was that the... That was in 1997. Okay. But there was a... Um, um, there was a vase done by, I think, uh, Frida Louise Hammers that went out, that was advertised in a Rago auction. And this was in the early 90s. And his estimate was six to $800. Now, a lot of these prices, it could be, give or take a hundred or a thousand dollars, is best in my memory. So he had no clue what he had at the 
at the time. But, you know, it was, um, and uh, two people wanted it. Two NDSU or uh, UND collectors wanted it. And it went up to $16,000. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, That's you know. part of the fever. Well, that did. And so then the auction houses, the East Coast auction houses and so on, um, they went, we might be missing something here. So they started looking for better pieces, but they don't come around very often. Yeah. And um, so that kind of made it a national thing. But there were there were local people that pushed to get UND recognized as being a legitimate American art pottery. Bob Barr, who was um, whose father was in the art department at UND, um, great proponent of, of the pottery. And one of my mentors, Darlene Dummel was another one. Um, fabulous. Her and her husband, Jim, uh, promoted it and, and um, traveled over, wrote the book, wrote two books on North Dakota pottery. And so that's how it took off. And of course, those that, I mean, there are collectors, Greg, in North Dakota that have incredible collections. Oh, I bet. And nobody knows about it because yeah. they're not selling it. Yeah. They've been keeping, they've been um, collecting longer than I have and they have wonderful stuff. Yeah. Um, it's the uh, stuff, you know, with the advent of the internet and so on, um, people start to know about it. But the, the internet has really kind of made a mass confusion of the value of UND pottery. I think it's happened with lots of things like that too, right? Like it's just sort of, I think, I think there's enough like Roseville and Weller and Rookwood and some of the more, those types of pottery, there's enough inventory out there that it sort of balances way out and you, you get a better sense for value. But it's interesting you say that because we sell a lot of uh, Nihilic Mission Swirl and there's some folks in the Arkansas area that have five, 600 pieces of swirl and they've got these massive floor vases and things that you just never even know were, were produced. So I'm sure there's some amazing collections out there of UND. Well, oh, there are, there are, and, and much, uh, you know, and they've been doing it longer than I have. There was a dealer in, from Grand Forks who really um, um, was ahead of his time. Um, he's deceased now, uh, but um, his name was Kirk Carlson. And he promoted it and sold it. He wasn't a collector, but he lived, you know, a few blocks from the university. And um, he told everybody he knew or encountered about UND pottery, whether you knew about it or not. Yeah. So there was guys like him, and he sent pieces out to the East Coast to, to auction to some of the bigger auction houses. And that's how things get started. And that's how they got started then. Um, so uh, yeah, it's guys like him that helped him and Bob Barr and, and um, Donald Miller who wrote the, um, the cable years yeah. and, and all those people and Darlene Dummel and, and um, these guys. And then there's guys like me who didn't have a pot to pee in at the time who would find stuff, but I couldn't be, couldn't afford to buy it. Yeah. So, you know, I was kind of a seller. I wasn't a collector. And then um, I thought, well, if I can sell all these Flostoria dinner plates, I can buy and keep a piece of UND. Yeah, yeah. So that's how it started. And then yeah. a, a average piece of UND turned into a better piece of UND, et cetera. Yeah. But it took me years. I mean, I, I started doing this um, in the early... 80s yeah and um and then uh it re and back then um the big prices you weren't getting big prices but um i i never saw good pieces uh till um i was invited to my friend kurt <laughs> Rustin's house sure i know kurt yeah kurt, kurt bought um beautiful uh unds um arts and crafts pieces that people don't see. Yeah. You know, and um, I have a couple today, but um, they're few and far between. But he had them and I just, when I saw it, I said, what is that? Now back then he was collecting mostly 30s Roseville. 
jarred and pets. Yeah. Know, Nita and Sunflower yeah. and like that. I bought a few um, of those from him over the years. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you have, you know, but he had a, a wonderful things. And then on my way to Western North Dakota to see my in-laws, um, I would stop at Bob Barr's antique store in Mandan. And in the when you go in the front door, he had a, a case there and he would have all the production um, UNDs and some some hand painted and hand carved. And they were wonderful. And he'd have prices like 2000 3000 and so on. And I told Marilyn, I said, oh, someday we'll be able to buy a piece like that. Yeah. You know, and eventually we did. Of course, I think I've owned every production piece of UND ever made. <laughs> really? That's amazing. Day. Yeah. I mean, but I bought huge collections of it. Yeah. Well, hey, just to kind of help, you know, folks that maybe don't know a lot about UND, why don't we just talk a little bit about just sort of the, you know, what are the, the, the time periods? So when did they start making UND? How long did they produce it? Maybe we can talk about that for a little bit. Well, Cable came there in 1910 Okay, from the Handicraft Guild in Minneapolis. They okay. needed to hire um, they needed to hire a professional potter to utilize the North Dakota clays. And um, so she was hired and right away she started to, you know, she was a, a learner. I mean, she she studied under um, some of the great studio potters yeah. in the country. And she wasn't afraid to learn. And so she, some of the first and the earliest UND, um, as far as the pottery are concerned, were beautiful arts and crafts style, you know, in the, you know, I mean, she went to Marblehead. She, yeah. uh, she went to uh, Newcomb College and visited there. I mean, she went to every major uh, um, pottery at the time. Was it uh, UND, was it University of North Dakota that like, was sending clay to like other potteries to like have yeah, them make yeah, yeah their, they were that's pot out of they, uh, North Dakota yeah. clay. Yeah, that's before they hired her for the most part. Okay, so that was like they an old guy. If it was viable, yeah. And, you know, uh, Ferrock, um, yeah. little known pottery today, but um, they were an arts and crafts uh, pottery, and and they sent them to. Uh, play to them and they actually made some pretty nice stuff and stuff hasn't, that. hasn't there been pots i forget, it was like marble like you mentioned marblehead but even like they like there has been other companies that have like some early rare pieces that have like nd for north dakota clay on it right like it was right, like from, right. The from the university right but um and then they figured um so um cable was tasked with utilizing the clay and then her her mission statement kind of changed into more of a, I got to be able to support this department. Okay. They had to sell it. And um, they started making, of course, they hired, you know, her assistants and um, other teachers, which were, you know, all very talented women. So who, who are the other uh, popular teachers? Just well, um Frida Louise Hammers. Yep. Hammers. Julia Madsen. Um, uh, and Julia, Julia was like, she was the most prolific maker, right? Like you, you but, see Madsen but, pottery, um, like all, all seems like nine out of ten pieces are gonna be Madsen. Yeah, but there were there were um potters there that, for example, Hildegard Fried, right, right, who was there for about six years as well. Okay. The uh, eight, you know, not very long, um, but she never made a piece of pottery that was a dog. I mean, okay. her stuff was absolutely stunning, and it's hard to come by because she wasn't there that long. Yeah. But in terms of her artistry, it was second to none. Same with um, uh, Hammers. Hammers' stuff is beautiful. Plus, she she uh, developed glazes. Um, she did all of those things. I mean, she was a jack of all trades. And then her sister, um, Huckfield, for Huckfield, she came along and, and um, you know, she never even, you know, some of these women, well, basically they worked for peanuts. Now, I, I, as a North Dakota teacher in high school, um, my, my first paycheck or my first year's salary was $13,500. Wow. 
And I told Marilyn at the time, I said, if you can make seven, we'll be making twenty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> and I said, we're going to be rich. Rich. <laughs> Back then, they were making something like fifteen hundred dollars a year. Wow. You know, and 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 uh, Margaret Cable when she would go and do demonstrations and stuff like that, she never got paid for that. If they did get a stipend, it went to the university. Yeah really took advantage of these women but uh, they didn't care they loved it they did it for art's sake and for teaching sake yeah, yeah. so i mean um cable um um really when you think about it she was as um not as prolific but at the same time she was so willing to teach other people i mean she went down to pine ridge and taught the uh, yeah natives um you know how to throw and how to make a viable business out of it yeah and because of that you know you have a lot of pine ridge on your site right now yeah it's beautiful yeah. stuff it's actually yeah, it's very beautiful stuff it's amazing it's very high quality it's stuff. amazing and then it, at first they would and you know this is we didn't have interstate highways back then so these were long, dusty trips. <laughs> yeah. And I've been to Pine Ridge. You know, a Pine Ridge from Grand Forks is a long way. Yeah. And um, um, so she went down there. And then when they, the women of Pine Ridge would finish, they would send this stuff back up to UND to be fired. You know, so that's another, you know, you oh. have stages there. And then after it was fired, then it was shipped back down to Pine Ridge so the women could sell it. So they were they never fired pottery at Pine Ridge in Pine Ridge. Well, they might have later, you know, but, but at the first, initial early years it was sent back to right, and that's in the third. I didn't months. know that. This is in the middle of the depression too. Okay. I mean the depression. You know, cable. Um, if you look at the time she was there, nineteen ten to nineteen forty nine, she was there in the middle of the depression. Yeah. She had to make things work, and then World War Two started. And during World War II, people really worried about buying pottery. They were worried about, you know, feeding their families. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In a very un unpredictable time. So she had a lot of things going against her, and she managed to really um, establish a viable American art pottery. Yeah. Today, some of the pieces are as beautiful as any. Mm hmm but you know, UND doesn't get the the respect that the other American air potteries get because of the clunky stuff that's out there. Yeah, because well, that's most of what you see nowadays, right? I see you got some very nice piece in your back shelf there. But hey, before we get into that, and I, I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. You know, I, one of the things we talked about is we're going to do this in probably two or three different parts. Sure. So, um, you know, I might just conclude part one here. I got one last question for you, and we'll kind of conclude part one, and then. We'll make a second and third part of these as well. But um, so I guess, you know, if somebody is going to start a UND collection, what would be your recommendation? Because I know exactly how what you're saying. If you look on eBay or you look on like, you know, different websites, my site included sometimes, you'll see some fairly poor examples, some molded student pieces that aren't real high quality. And then just helping helping somebody, uh, you know, without going too deep into all that, because again, we want to save some of this for the next next episode. But like, just if you were just going to start, like, just say you had a thousand dollars and you're going to start a UND collection, what would you, what would you recommend to somebody just starting out trying to start a collection? Well, first of all, um, I'm trying not to buy on eBay. Yeah. You know, because um, um, you don't know what you're getting. Yeah. And oftentimes the people that are selling them are not pottery dealers. And they don't know what they're selling. That's yeah, a great they don't point. know what they're selling. And, yeah. and they think they do, but they don't. Yeah. But yeah. I would suggest there are just do your research, look at books, look at uh, live auctioneers, and then go to end of auctions. Yeah. And type in school of mines. And then what the pots you'll that'll pop up, you will see good examples of uh, North, uh, North Dakota School of Mines pottery. Yeah. That first of all, you got to like it. But for example, um, UND made more but at least 300 pieces of little prairie rose vases all <laughs> you bought one for me years ago as a matter yeah. of fact first 
piece of UND you ever bought from me? Maybe, yeah. Madison, Wisconsin. And um, you can still get one of those for around three or four hundred dollars. And that's an but, iconic base, too, honestly. That's a that's it a is an cool pot. And they did a lot of prairie rose stuff, but they um it's all hand thrown, hand carved, and um made in around it made in 1930. Yeah. There's a lot of them out there. And I assume you'd suggest yeah, sticking with you probably suggest sticking with um an instructor piece rather than a student piece to get well, stuff with or but no, much. I would I would also say if you like a, um their um what they call their um, Spencer list items um, or their, um, you know, the, the, the pottery that was made in molds and, and made specifically to sell. Yeah. Um, now, some of those are beautiful. There's some on eBay right now that if they didn't have damage would be really nice. Yeah. They made killer, um, you know, they it was their production piece, like Rookwoods. Yeah, Rookwoods had their production line. Uh, UND had their production line, but UND's production line was some of them were stunning vases. There was something I always wanted. I dreamed of getting the Duck Hunter vase, where a guy is with a shotgun and he has ducks on his hip and the dog. Well, I waited years to find one. Well, then I found like four. Oh <laughs> wow! Know? And I ended up selling all of them. Okay. Know? Yeah, but uh, there's that, and there's um, there's an Indian in Traboy's vase where you have a Native American on a on a horse, and he's pulling a Traboy's, which is you know his his possibles or his you know the stuff he's using yeah. to to travel. Yeah, it's a beautiful vase, you know. So and then you've seen the big ox cart vase, big fat. Yeah. Which, those are exceptional vases. It's a huge piece of for UND too. And they come out now. So if you find a production piece, piece um, you have that uh, kind of that Scandinavian inspired one on your site. I don't know if you've sold it or not. I still have it. Yeah, that's car. It's the carved one. Yeah, the carved. Yeah, that, that's a super cool vase. You yeah. Know? I mean, that used to be very popular because you know North Dakota has a large Scandinavian uh, population. You know? Yeah which I was one of. All right. Well, hey, I appreciate it, Tony. Um, we'll yeah. wrap up our first session one here, but um, I thank you very much for your time. And then we'll uh, we'll do a couple more sessions of this. And hopefully at some point, if we have any questions, maybe we'll do a fourth session as a follow-up. So All thanks, right. Tony. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you bet.